Welcome back, insiders. As you may know, crypto has been on a massive run since its crypto winter lows. We got Bitcoin up 4x and many alts way more than that, like Solana up 30x. And Coin or Coinbase, which we're going to be talking about today, is up 8x from its lows. It's actually been one of my favorite stocks, but still worth holding or maybe even buying more of. That's what we're going to be figuring out. So whether you're a crypto hodler and or Coinbase investor, this is the video for you. Here's also some more things that we're going to be discussing. Coinbase's current situation. We got risk factors, SEC lawsuits, short-term prices, and maybe fundamentals. Uh, like, is it overvalued? But, you know, who cares about fundamentals anyway nowadays? We're also going to talk about some upsides like finances, some more fundamentals. We're going to talk about Brian Armstrong and crypto macros, which arguably you can make a bull or bear case out of either one. We got institutions with their ETFs. We got stable coins and the happening on everyone's mind. So a lot to cover. I'm going to try to keep each individual topic as short as possible because, like I said, there's a lot going on. If you do want me to expand in any individual topic, like the best platforms for staking your crypto, I'd be happy to do so. Just let me know in the comments below. Now, let's get right into it. Uh, the issues with the SEC. So this is something that's just ongoing. It's always back and forth. And one of the big ones was on June 21st, 2023, which now is already, oh my God, almost uh, almost a year, a year ago. It feels like it was just yesterday. Anywho, the SEC is on Coinbase's case, like always, trying to figure out if what it's doing is securities related or not. So right here provides a marketplace or Coinbase allegedly provides a marketplace and brings together the orders for securities of multiple buyers and sellers. I mean, that's basically the order book, but is it a security, right? Is crypto a security? So that's what they're arguing back and forth. There's so many arguments for either side. I just wanna give you guys the overview of what's what's been going on. Uh, engages in businesses of affecting security transactions for accounts of Coinbase customers and serves as an intermediary in setting transactions or settling transactions in crypto asset securities. This one was more or less thrown out because of the wallet uh, discussion, but this one right here uh, talks more a little bit about staking and the issues with staking because it's a security as well. Man, the SEC has really, really been on their case. And, you know, it's no surprise. And, you know, Gary Gensler, he is... <laughs> I would probably consider him and most people would consider him pretty anti-crypto, which I find pretty weird because I've actually, and this was years ago, this came out in 2020, yeah. I remember watching this during COVID. I watched his MIT course on cryptocurrency and I was like, wow, this guy actually has a pretty good understanding of cryptocurrency, but in terms of you know federal regulations, he's pretty hardline against it. At least that's what a lot of his policies uh, feel like. And I know Brian Armstrong, the CEO, of Coinbase has, <laughs> it's it's a constant back and forth between him and uh, Gary Gensler. So this is this is a big thing. And we got a few companies, or I, yeah, that's the thing. Is it a company? Is it not a company? So we have a few cryptocurrencies, right? We got Solana, we got Chill Is, which I actually don't know much about, but these two are hot topics for securities, both of, one, both of which you can buy on Coinbase. I do own, I do own a Solana, but I don't own any Chillas. Um, again, you know, is it related to, are the profits of, or let's say the appreciation of the price of Solana or Chillas related to the activities of what the developers at these companies do or the team at these companies do? That's a lot of the argument. There's also many other specs we can cover if a company is a security or not, or if a crypto is a security or not. I would actually love to make a whole video on that. If you're curious, let me know. Again, I just wanna cover all the main topics that we're uh, facing right now. Anyway, Coinbase wins a lawsuit on alleged securities violation. This sounds really good. It came out just recently, but actually if you do a little bit more uh, digging into this one, Coinbase actually only won secondary sales of crypto uh, did not violate any securities law. So um, anything related to their uh, exchanges, right? The actual exchange itself. So the IPOs or the ICOs are still a big problem. So that's being investigated. But it shows there's progress, there's discussion, there's some people that are still very pessimistic that Coinbase is going to have wins. But I am a little bit more optimistic because, you know, you see stuff like this all the time. Oh, let me zoom out a little bit. Um, and I always recommend if you're investing in a company, always follow the actual company itself. Uh, for example, on Twitter to see what they're up to. Coinbase, April 4th, you know, good news here. They uh, re restricted dealer in Canada. Um, basically, 
They're one of the largest exchanges now, cryptocurrency exchanges in Canada. They got some good regulation over there. So they're really hands-on with trying to get regula uh, regulation and working with regulators. And that makes me very, very optimistic. But I'll talk a little bit more about other things I'm optimistic on uh, related to Coinbase uh, in the second section of this video. Now, one of the things that I also do wanna mention here is I did come out with a video on staking on Coinbase, pros and cons like two years ago called is staking on coinbase worth it and coinbase has always notoriously been super super high on fees from trading to staking uh, their staking is anywhere from 25 to 35 percent while other platforms like stake fish offer zero percent fees so i was thinking about making a video on that let me know if that is something you guys would be interested in and man do i look suspicious in this video I, like i'll tell you what if, if you know what i mean you know what i mean uh, let's keep going here because elevated prices short term have been a little bit insane, right? As I was saying, Bitcoin is up from its lows right around here till here. Like I said earlier, around 4x and then Solana, which is up from its lows right here, about 30x is what I was saying earlier. So two point, I think I missed that somewhere. Uh, I, I used this one before anyway. Um, right in this area, it's about uh, 24x, but I, I was using this uh, low point before. This is a weekly chart, shows how crazy it's been. I'm a little bit less bullish that Solana is gonna have a new all-time high like Bitcoin, just because Solana is not a deflationary cryptocurrency and there's constantly new coins being uh, put into that ecosystem. But that is also a debate for another time. It just I just wanna show you the rallies we've been seeing have been absolutely insane. We also have coin. I want to show you guys this one as well. Uh, elevated prices short term as this is the topic right now. So this is uh, Thinkorswim, the primary broker that I use. And from its lows of 31.55, it went up around 800%. So that was the 8X I was talking about before. Right now we're about like 7X or 6.7X. And you know, I just think you know after such a strong rally, I would like for a little bit more of a pullback. So I would be looking for something around this former shoulder right here, about 187, somewhere in the 200s. I think that would be a pretty good accumulation zone. I do think short term, there might be a little bit too many risks and just a little bit too much of a rally, too soon, too quick. But I think if you are a crypto believer and specifically a Coinbase believer, it doesn't hurt to just constantly be accumulating into your winners and be cutting your losers. That is basically investing and trading philosophy 101. You don't wanna be sizing down into losers unless you are, let's say, maybe investing really long-term and you know something about the company and you're just getting a better deal. But most times when you're trading specifically, averaging into losers is a big no-no. So right now you are, you would be averaging into a winner and that's just never a bad situation. The market cap here is $60 billion. So we've had quite a move off the lows and everything about it, you know, looks pretty good. No dividend, obviously, because it is a growth ticker. Let's keep going here. So we have, uh, this is a little bit my, my problem as well with elevated prices short term. And you know, fundamentals aren't that relevant in this market. I mean, just look at DJT, right? right? Donald J. Trump ticker is what it feels like. The current price of coin based on a DCA, discounted cash flow model, which is like the standard model uh, in finance is 256. So it's like, what are their cash flows and what's the uh, valuation on those cash flows specifically? Now. <laughs> that's quite a big overvaluation of what this model would actually come out uh, to be. So current price versus fair value. I think I actually just said that wrong. This is the DCA, this is the current price, and this is the percent it's overvalued. So in that regard, bit extended, and if crypto pulls back a little bit, which some of these candles or some of these chart pattern patterns might actually look like, a little bit of consolidation here, maybe a dip below this uh, EMA, uh, same with Bitcoin, a little bit of consolidation might actually be good and maybe a healthy pullback. So I, I would just think, you know, right now, short term, I would like on coin to see a little bit more of a pullback myself. So I think that's one of the um, actually bigger bear cases for this uh, ticker. Hey guys, did you know you can get this content early in text form on tradejournal.co? For more content like this, be sure to follow my portfolio, my profile, 
at tradejournal.co forward slash Winkler. Once you follow me, you'll be notified of new trades or posts that I come out with. You can also fine tune your interests. For example, if you're only interested in my stock investments, but not my day trades or my NFTs, just mute those portfolios. You can also get your own trading and investing analytics compiled for you. All you need to do is create an account and then follow the new onboarding guide to get set up. Now with 25 brokers with API sync, it's easier than ever. Your trades will automatically be imported for you, saving you time and any human errors. Know the why behind your PL curve and how to fix it. It's time to start maximizing your trading and investing alpha. Create your account on tradejournal.co today. Now let's talk about some more pros or some upsides for Coinbase, right? And these, these some of these have always been my favorite for years since their IPO. Short and long-term assets are greater than their short and long-term liabilities. So that is a really good sign, always something that makes me quite happy. They actually skewered a lot of money and um, bonds recently, so they have that cash on hand. Also, if you scroll down here, and this is literally one of my favorite things uh, since their IPO, Coin has more cash than total debt. So even if everything went wrong, they do have that nice cash pile to keep them alive. And Coin's debt is well covered by operating cash flows. Now you could argue if you know the whole macro scene goes down and people are no longer interested in crypto very quickly, Coin's operating cash flow would not cover its debt because most of that cash flow does come from trading activity. So there is that, but they are branching out into those other things like staking that we talked about before, which they charge an arm and leg for, so they do make a lot of money off of that. I also like the revenue expense breakdown. First of all, they are a profitable company, and in this macro environment, being a profitable company is just so good. They got three billion in revenue, and I love to see those kind of numbers. I mean, three billion revenue, guys, that is no joke, most of which comes from the United States, and that is kind of the red flag, right? That is where they're fighting for regulation, but I feel like America would be really shooting itself in the foot if they made any problems with Coinbase because it's one of the biggest crypto uh, regulated exchanges, and then what would happen with the crypto scene, right? It would go more underground and it just would not be a good place to be. So I don't know if I really think that the um, the legal and the lawsuits are gonna end in a way where Coinbase is no longer operating in the United States. Um, but yeah, it, it is worth noting that almost all, I would say, their revenue comes for you, from the US. So there it is. Uh, another big asset, I would argue, is their CEO. He's an extremely, extremely strong, strong CEO. And uh, there's so much to cover about him that I'll probably save it for another video. If you guys are interested, let me know. I would love to make a Brian Armstrong video. I've been following him for a very long time, so I actually might just do it regardless, even if you guys don't say anything. But um, he's definitely one of the entrepreneurs uh, to follow. He's really active and influential in the crypto space. He's continuously pushing for innovation, regulation, and crypto adoption. Uh, both within and beyond Coinbase. So I think that's really good. Actually, one of the great examples I found on him was uh, how he quashed the or squashed the woke uprising at his company back in uh, COVID times when they were uh, basically uniting on his Slack channels, trying to make him uh, become political like a lot of uh, other companies have become. And uh, he was one of the few CEOs to actually uh, shut that down while other CEOs were still scared to speak about it at the time. They had a huge coverage about this actually even on the All In podcast and they commended him quite a bit uh, for that back then. And that saved the company a lot of money. And they were actually very generous on the offboarding ramps of the people that didn't wanna kind of conform to the mission statement of the company. And they had other plans that they wanted to do inside the company. So I think he handled it very fairly and it really showed his strong leadership and he's always been very transparent and he's it seems like he's always pushing for the right thing um so I'm, I'm a big fan of brian armstrong for sure and i think uh you know there's there's always those handful of ceos that you want to ceos and founders and entrepreneurs that you want to follow and that just tend to always make good decisions over the decades and i think brian armstrong is definitely in that category so i i follow him closely and i like the projects he's he's always working on again i can make a whole video about brian armstrong and i probably will um, so it's it's definitely uh, worth mentioning. Uh, also, you know, Brian Armstrong, I would follow him on Twitter if you haven't done so already. And if you actually like Coinbase or an investor in Coinbase, because I think it gives you a good little roadmap of, of what's going on and kind of the, the feelings on the ground. 
Um, the other things I want to talk about is the crypto macros, which as you guys know, I think it was January 11th. Yeah, Jan 11th, I have them here in my notes. That was the big day where ETFs were approved and it's been absolutely insane out there. And unfortunately, this page keeps freezing on me and I can't actually uh, show you guys some of my outlines, but this part's really important here. Despite substantial outflows of nearly 9 billion from Grayscale, right? It was one of the biggest ETFs since the launch of ETFs. Net inflows into US uh, Bitcoin ETFs remain positive. These inflows totaling 7.35 billion originated from some of the biggest names in the in, uh, investment industry, including back BlackRock and Fidelity. Now, the reason Grayscale is having, having actually so many issues is because right here, 1.9 billion in a single day uh, and single week outflows is because, um, I, you know, I, I don't understand fully why they don't change this, but here we go. Grayscale's outflows have been due to the fees significantly higher than those of its rivals. I mean, obviously, what would you do? You would go to the lower rivals. So I, this is kind of crazy. I mean, they were kind of first to market, so maybe they're trying to do a little bit of what Coinbase does. They just make it easier. But with ETFs, it's already so easy. Uh, with staking, it's sometimes a little bit more complicated, so I can understand why Coinbase maybe charges a bit more. So yeah, their fees are just absurd. Look at this, 1.5% management fees compared to like 0.25 from BlackRock and Fidelity. So yeah, just a little bit crazy there. I'm not really sure what their game plan is, but seems a little bit absurd. We also have, um, so we have huge inflows, right, of money. And I'll show you guys a chart in a second of how much money is going to these uh, ETFs compared to exchanges. Um, and then we also have USDT and USDC uh, grew 10 billion in the past 30 days. And this, this article just came out April 8th. So this is very, very recent. Stable, stable coins might be a better signal for crypto demand than Bitcoin ETF inflows. Now, why are stable coins seeing such big growth? Well, it's due to the ability to combine benefits of cryptocurrency like speed and transparency of transactions with the stability of traditional fiat currencies. They offer less volatile option for crypto users, making them ideal for daily transactions, right? That's actually why I got into crypto originally. I've said this story many times on this channel. I needed to pay out individuals that were in certain countries that were very diff difficult to pay out. So I used to use uh, Western Union for a lot of our affiliates and freelancers. And it was, if you guys ever use Western Union, it's super, super expensive. And then wiring is also super expensive. So then I started using uh, Litecoins because it was just faster and a little bit cheaper than Bitcoin to pay out our um, affiliates. This is back when I uh, owned an affiliate network with my brother. So that, that's why I got into it. So I could see a lot of reasons why people are getting into stable coins. Um, so daily transaction, heading against volatility of other cryptocurrencies, etc. Uh, additionally, stable coins are increasingly used in DeFi ecosystems for lending, borrowing, and earning interest, further driving their adoption and growth. That DeFi, that's exactly, I think, a space that I'm a, I really, really like. I'm not so much involved in it anymore, but I used to be just, you know, out of pure practicality. So I could really, really see that. Here it talks a little bit about Black, um, BlackRock and Fidelity again. Um, being basically the big suppliers of ETFs, including institutional investors growing interest in cryptocurrencies, inflationary pressures, and the pursuit of alternative investments. So they also mention inflation, you know, a big thing for the rise of cryptocurrencies, which could be a rise in Coinbase as well, because I mean, technically Coinbase should be going up like 7% a year based on inflation alone, right? So that, that's a bull case for Coinbase, I would argue as well. Now let's talk about something else here because this, this is probably the, the thing that everyone's talking about a lot, and that is the Bitcoin happening and price projections, right? So in essence, what's happening with the Bitcoin happening, right? If you're a miner, you're basically getting smaller rewards. The first reward ever was 50 Bitcoin, and then November 8, 28th and 2012, uh, 25 Bitcoins, and then 12.5 and then 6.5. So every four years, roughly four years, that's what happens. So the next happening, which is expected to occur roughly in a week or so in April, 2024. So yeah, a week or so is gonna be cut in half again. And then going down here, the final happening is expected to occur in 20, uh, 2140. Wow, that's a really long time. The number of uh, Bitcoins circulating will reach the theor theoretical maximum supply of 21 million, right? So why is this so important, right? Because the actual supply 
of miners goes down. So there's less Bitcoin on the market. So now every time one of these mining pools gets rewarded in cryptocurrency that or Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is now less. And that happens every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, there's now less cryptocurrency being flooded into the market. So the supply in a way actually goes down, or at least I guess you could say the new supply. So as long as based on, you know, fundamentals, supply and demand curve, as long as the demand stays constant, the price should go up. And if demand even increases, then the price should go up even more. And I think this is this is what's going to be really interesting. And we'll show you guys um, why the, the demand should actually be increasing a little bit. First of all, I want to show you guys this stock. Uh, Bitcoin stock to flow model and this annoying little thing always pops up at the top here I don't know how to get rid of it Anyway, this line right here are the happening dates and you can see we're right around that happening date and last time we had a big increase in spike a big or a big increase in price and then a big increase in price as well so they, it, it, there has been a correlation with increases in price. So it definitely makes sense. A few times we've had a quick little pullback or consolidation, and maybe we'll have a little pullback and consolidation, and that's what I feel like is gonna happen. But in general, there should be an increase in price just based on historical trends. Here's actually a pretty interesting post that came out, what is that, like 10 days ago, roughly, um, talking about the demand potentially increasing as well. And here's some interesting areas to highlight. So speculation on the impact of ETFs and on Bitcoin supply and prices is gaining traction among market observers with predictions of a looming supply squeeze within the next six to 12 months, driven by demand surpassing available Bitcoin for sale. And he says that explaining the chart below, which we'll look at in a second. So on top of the looming supply squeeze, as he says, he mentions also the Bitcoin happening, which is gonna be less supply out there as well. And the chart he shows here, let me get rid of this and hide that and open the chart. He basically shows this orange line is the exchange balance total of exchanges um, for Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin supply has, on exchanges has actually been going down, most likely because ETFs are holding on to uh, more and more Bitcoin. Uh, but that is really worth noting and the price is going up, right? So supply in theory is going down and now it should be going down even faster because of the happening while the price is going up and a higher Bitcoin price should be good for Coinbase. Cause again, we are talking about Coinbase in the end here. And this is actually the chart that he's talking about here on Glass Node Studio, where it shows the reserves of Bitcoin at, uh, on these different exchanges. And basically ever since right around 2020, this number has been going up pretty consistently. Now it's really starting to trend down and it doesn't really seem like it's stopping. It looks like it's a little bit in the catch, you know, if you if you try to find support here, you'd be catching a falling knife. So a little bit iffy. And coming back to the stock flow chart, I do want to mention, you know, does the price or does the demand uh, stay constant or go up? Well, let's talk a little bit about the miners, right? So price needs to go up to maintain the attractiveness of mining, right? If you're a miner and or if you're a miner, right? Uh, if your computer is mining for you, are you gonna keep mining if you're getting less Bitcoin? Well, the price would have to go up to make it more attractive. So that's the caveat there. Now, now generally, if there is fewer miners, the remaining miners would find more profitability because that reward is distributed to fewer players. So if it becomes unprofitable because your rig sucks, it's inefficient, and you're using old GPUs or whatever have you, uh, it might not be attractive for you anymore because electricity is more expensive or what have you. So if so, you might stop and then the reward increases for the other miners that are sharing that pool. The problem is the less miners, the less secure the network. So you don't want too many people falling off of Bitcoin uh, if, the, if they're the miner, right? You wanna have a lot of miners from a lot of different sources. Uh, that's the important part to keep a secure network. So all these things we can debate and um, they're definitely interesting to debate and I would be happy to go onto individual more topics. And now really quickly, Bitcoin is the ninth biggest asset in the world right now at 1.385 trillion with a nice little increase so far the last seven days. We got Tesla down here at place 15, but it's had a big boost recently. Uh, at 568 billion, what else we got? We got silver at 1.6 trillion. 
we got gold at the biggest asset at almost 16 trillion. So it's really good to know all these different numbers. It gives you a little bit more of a headspace. So, you know, if Bitcoin was to replace gold, we're, we're seeing like a 11, 12 X increase from the current price. Is it gonna happen? I'm not really sure. I mean, that's a lot of money that would have to come from somewhere and that money would have to come from somewhere if it happened right now. Now, if it happened over the course of five or 10 years, inflation naturally will you know create new money that can flood into some of these assets and that's what a lot of the debate is right now that bitcoin is a little bit of an inflation head hedge but you know gold is also a bit of an inflation hedge so that money would potentially trickle trickle into both and technically everything here as owning a company is also an inflation hedge and it wouldn't be a cryptocurrency video if we didn't show the fear and greed index which right now is at 80 but you know what they say you want to average into your winners you want to double down onto your winners those are the ones you make a lot of money in so you know 80 sure that's a lot of greed and fear i mean extreme greed but it can always go more and these are the tipping points, right? This is actually when you make most of your money is when things go exponential. So we'll see what happens. I feel like there's gonna be short term, maybe a bit of a pullback and then a rally, but anything could happen. This is definitely not financial advice and I've been burnt a lot in crypto. So it might actually be best to do the exact opposite of what I think that might actually be your best bet. Poo wee, that was a lot to talk about in this video. So I appreciate you guys tuning in and dropping that like. I'll see you guys next time.